We don't know exactly what the situation is in Fukushima, but I think it's important to move forward, even if it's only one little step. TEPCO executives say they are planning to start removing debris from the plant in 2020. They haven't worked out how to do that yet. There are many challenges ahead, but they are taking small steps in the right direction. Yoshihito Kamitani, NHK World. TEPCO officials have sent a second robot into the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. It follows a robot that searched a reactor's containment vessel on Friday. However, it only made it a short distance, but TEPCO officials say it helped with the decades-long task of decommissioning the plant. NHK World's Yoshihito Kametani has more. The first robot only made it 10 meters into the Reactor 1 containment vessel, but TEPCO officials say it sent back valuable data. The Geiger counter says the radiation is 10 sievers per hour. That's high enough to cure a person in 40 minutes. The robot filmed a piece of debris about 15 centimeters in diameter. TEPCO's general manager says it's too early to say exactly what it is. We can see fist-sized objects falling and also what appear to be metal clasps. At this point, we aren't sure where they came from. Experts say the white dot in the video was probably caused by radiation. The camera showed steam rising inside the vessel. Kovacs says that's probably water at the bottom evaporating. But he said the video doesn't reveal anything about the state of the melted fuel. We can see steam in the video, but it's not coming from the melted fuel. It's from the water used to cool the fuel, so it's not telling us what we wanted to know about where the fuel is or what state it's in. TEPCO used this robot. It could snake its way through narrow spaces. They sent it through a narrow pipe into the containment vessel. It then transformed into a shape that allowed it to move stably. Kovacs says TEPCO has sent another robot into the same reactor, and they have been working with engineers on a next-generation device. It will become important to lower radiation levels as much as possible, so people can work there. That's what we're doing right now. They have been developing one that can clean up higher areas. It's equipped with a kind of gun that will blast debris and a hose that will suck up the fine particles. One of the engineers says he's eager to do anything he can to support the work at the plant. We don't know exactly what the situation is in Fukushima. But I think it's important to move forward, even if it's only one little step. TEPCO executives say they are planning to start removing debris from the plant in 2020. They haven't worked out how to do that yet. There are many challenges ahead, but they are taking small steps in the right direction. Yoshihito Kamitani, NHK World.
20 years after the Earth moved. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has visited the scene of one of Japan's worst natural disasters. A powerful earthquake devastated Kobe City and claimed more than 6,000 lives. Abe visited a park in the western port city of Kobe on Saturday. A flame has been kept burning since January 2000 as a symbol of reconstruction. The Prime Minister offered flowers at a monument bearing the names of about 5,000 victims of the quake. Abe also visited a shoe manufacturer in one of the worst hit areas. After the quake, the company revived its business by launching a new brand named Corbe Shoes. Abe then talked with people who share their quake experiences with visitors and explained the city's reconstruction efforts. The number of people who live through the disaster is declining, and I want to pass on what I've learned to the next generation. It's necessary to look into how the lessons learned from the 1995 quake have been used in the aftermath of the quake that struck northeastern Japan in 2011. Almost 640,000 buildings were destroyed or damaged by the quake 20 years ago. More than 6,400 people died. Members of the UN committee reviewing the nuclear non-proliferation treaty are engaging in a conflict. Chinese delegates are rejecting the way the Japanese want to word the final agreement. They say the reason is rooted in their shared wartime history. Japanese delegates said the agreement should include a call for world leaders to visit Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They said that would help them learn the inhumanity of nuclear weapons for further education for future generations in particular on nuclear disarmament naturally leads to an idea that one of the most effective ways to that end is to the visit to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But a revised draft did not contain that call. Delegates from China had persuaded the chairperson to remove it. Delegates from some countries in Europe and Africa supported Japan. They said people should gain a broader understanding of the inhumanity of nuclear weapons. Chinese Ambassador Hu Tson said the Japanese were free to invite world leaders by themselves, but he said his country could not allow them to include that call in the deal at the non-proliferation talks. He tied the Japanese emphasis on Hiroshima and Nagasaki to what he suggested was a wrong interpretation of history. Why should they force us, countries like China? They have denied repeatedly on their history of invasion of other countries. Delegates will keep talking next week. Japan's Environment Ministry says that concentrations of an air pollutant known as PM2.5 exceeded standards at more than 80% of the country's monitoring points in fiscal 2013. Experts say the tiny particles could cause diseases such as asthma and bronchitis. They blow toward Japan from China and are a component of vehicle exhaust. The ministry says to stay healthy, people should be exposed to no more than a daily average of 35 micrograms per cubic meter and a yearly average of 15 micrograms. Ministry officials analyzed data obtained at 492 monitoring points from April 2013 to March 2014. The results show that concentration levels exceeded the guidelines at 413 monitoring points, about 84% of the total. Ministry officials attribute the results to the increased occurrence of photochemical smog containing PM2.5 particles during the summer. They say the concentration was also up in the winter, when the wind was too gentle to scatter the airborne pollutants. Wow. Animals like to get in it? Well, no, none.